Viola is Australia's newest integrated steelworks. The plant uses the world's most modern technique of steel making, known as the basic oxygen steel process. At the time of World War II, the government built a blast furnace in Wyala and then decided they would build ships here. And after the war, the blast furnace was expanded to a fully functional steelworks. And the resulting scream is symbolic of the jet age of steel making. The steelworks spurned. If you go to a, an office block or a, or a huge car park or something, it, that, that's wireless steel, uh, usually, it's it, and rail, rail tracks. Where once only the Wallaby roamed the Saltbush Plain, families, thousands of them, now call this place home. Mm. Now that one should give you some carrot and cheek. Yeah. <laughs> so what did you say that your uh, grandpa used to do out at the company, Mum? He got his apprenticeship as a fitter and turner and both his brothers did their apprenticeship with the company as well. Steel is definitely in my blood. My great-grandfather worked for the company uh, at the shipyards. All right, I'm off. Going to work. All right, do you want me to put some food in a container for you for crib? My father works for the company. And I even met my partner, Dylan, at the steelworks. All right, see you all later. Yeah. He saw me across the floor of the blast furnace and sparks flew, I don't know. <laughs> I actually started as a secretary and my boss came to me and said, you know, you're too smart to just be a secretary. I think you should go for, for one of these cadetships, you know, and, and study engineering. So I graduated with a degree of metallurgical engineering uh, with honours. Well, I think that the berries collapsed and it's filled up. So I've been rocking a hard hat in the high vis for 10 years. So every day I put on that uniform with a sense of pride that I'm going to go to work and I'm going to make steel for Australia. You know, it's it's, it's amazing. If, if you think about it like that, it's it's amazing. Yeah. What's the update, Phil? When are we going to start charging, mate? Uh, about 12 o'clock. Yep. It should be up to temperature around about midday. And... Mm -hmm. I got the sense that things weren't going so well with the company in early 2016. We had another round of redundancies and it was savage. And we're all sort of looking at each other going, what's going on? Six months into the financial new year, Anarium continues to struggle with low steel and commodity prices. The company that ran the Whaler Steelworks was called Arium, and it was getting into trouble because the world was moving on from commodity steel to premium products to specialised steel. But Arium was tied in to a business model that was being superseded. They essentially made a whole shift of people redundant. And on the fence of the car park, they'd all hung their helmets up on the fence as a goodbye. I saw that and I just, in my heart, I felt so upset for those people who have just lost their livelihood because of the state that the company was in. I work with 50 different guys, I know all their names. Because you spend so long working with them, they're your, your second family. Wyala is one of those communities where if somebody's damaged, they band together. Everyone's involved with sport. There's, uh, you've got your churches here, there's rotary clubs. It's a very tight-knit community. 121.7, 77.3, 3.3, 3 .3. The Steelworks has always been a, a fairly solid rock. See ya. It started out with a little bit of pressure from management coming to us and saying, we need to cut costs. Yeah, can you check that the thermocouples are plugged into the tundish, please? Basically, the, the ultimatum was that we were losing too much money and if we can't uh, stop that hemorrhage, that we were facing closure. Everybody was doing their best and then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, overnight, we were in administration. Arium management announced this morning the company was going into receivership, saying all other options had been exhausted. And it was kind of, you know, is this real? Uh, are you serious? Like, can that happen? <laughs> you know, is a, a big company as ours, are we in voluntary administration? It's not one of those things you want to come home and, and say to your wife, hey, um, how was your day? Good. By the way, uh, our property value has just diminished within a heartbeat and I might not have a job anymore. What's for tea? Right, 
I was one of the four administrators of the Arium Group. My personal reaction to looking at the books and records with my team was one, well, gee, you know, this business is very challenged. There was a high probability that the previous management prior to the administrators were looking to close Wyala. So this was as scary as it gets when it comes to, you know, an administration process. The Aaron administration is probably the most complex administration quarter mint has ever done and probably the most complex in terms of Australian corporate history. 6,000 employees, four billion in debt, a business that had 70% of the Australian structural steel market uh, could disappear overnight. But when you look into the eyes of the employees, that's where you see the vulnerability and the fear. We need to grab some tiny teddies. Yeah. Are you going to grab them for Mum? Two weeks after the administration was announced, I found out I was pregnant. If we knew that the company was going to go into administration, uh, we definitely would not have made the decision to have another baby at that time. I was very worried that I was going to lose my job. Yeah, it's a papa. <coughs> Our worst fear was that the plant was going to shut down. Lovely. That would be the end of the town. It would be the end of life as I know it. Jared, you need to open up your ears and listen. We didn't want to leave Wyala. This is our home and this is where our family and friends are and our house is. We didn't want to leave and it was, it was going to come to that. Make sure we're looking at that ball before we pick it up. Righto, go, 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 go. Head up. Good work. My worst fear was that I uh, was going to have to chase work in possibly another state and not be a part of the family and the family was going to be stuck in a community, in a, in a city where I'm not even sure whether the schools were still going to run. You guys going to wear yourselves out? There was the possibility of, uh, you know, a mass exodus. Lead out, Iggy, lead out. If the steelworks had shut, I would have been left with a block of dirt that I couldn't pay for with a house on it. Unless I found gainful employment somewhere else, I wasn't going to be able to pay the bank back. And the bank, I guarantee the bank didn't want my property because uh, they would have had 30,000 others as well. People in town just stopped buying things. And then, of course, you get that ripple effect through the whole community. The housing market crashed. People couldn't leave because they couldn't sell their houses. You know, businesses went broke and uh, it, was, it was just massively horrible for the whole town. Wyler is fast becoming Mark Menzies' home away from home. Well, I'm a country boy and, you know, when I walk into a town like Wyala, you know, it, it just resonates with country values. You know, it has six football teams and six soccer teams and six schools and six pubs and it became very obvious that this town, this great community of Wyala, wanted to save itself. Save Bassfield! Save Bassfield! Everyone had to play their part. The first people we went to were the contractors. We looked at government and what they could do. We then went to the employees so we were trying to stabilise the business in a, in a spectrum that would allow it to continue as a profitable going concern. So we did the rip around across all four shifts to come up with some cost saving initiatives. Uh, and they approached everybody from the coalface to the top of the ladder to get some ideas on anything we could do to reduce the cost of making steel, to try and get close to making a profit to make it a saleable company. There's money to be saved from reducing the amount of mode changes we do every time. I'm also a delegate for the Australian Workers' Union. I was in a position where, like, I can throw my hands in the air and, and sulk and wait for the outcome, or I can throw myself at it with everything I've got and contribute wherever I can, which is, is what I chose to do. That's fine, we'll save all of that money. We are going to take $20 million from wages. We put a 10% wage reduction to the employees, set against the backdrop of where their house prices have halved. The reaction was incredibly hostile. If I've got 10% less money in my pocket at the end of the week, uh, I'm not going to go and buy coffees at the coffee shop or... They were bloody, they were personal, they were emotional, and they were probably one of the most difficult things I've ever had to do. And you'd have guys standing up at the, at the meetings going, you know, you can take your pay cut and stick it up your ass. You said to the guys on the shop floor, you should not be penalised for sins of management. Now you're coming, 12% wage cuts. Big roundabout turn, isn't it? And it came round to a vote, and the pay cut got voted down. 
And I've got to say, I was devastated. It's, it's a real difficulty for us to, to sell a business with an expired enterprise agreement. So, so while we're negotiating, South Australia had a catastrophic weather event. The lights went out, the phones went down, and all hell broke loose. For the first time in the history of the national energy market, an entire state was plunged into darkness. It was like the apocalypse. There was no noise, no hum. And I was driving through thinking, this is what it's going to be like if we close down. This is it. This is what the plant's going to be like. We had a, a pipeline, which is really the artery of the business, which is the slurry that comes from the iron ore mine to the pellet plant that feeds the blast furnace. It has the consistency of a toothpaste. If that solidified, the blood stops flowing to the blast furnace. And it only needed about another six hours and we would have had to relay 60 miles of pipeline at a cost which basically would have meant we would have closed that operation the next day. That's how close it got to closing Whaler and those iron ore mines. Got your 12 metre mark, 8 and 12. There to the first roll under the bed. Yeah. And I think that may have contributed a little bit as far as being a wake up call to hate how serious the situation is, how dire it is. And um, yeah, we went to another vote. So the fundamental message was you have to do this to save yourself. So reluctantly, I voted yes, knowing that uh, it was going to be the only way that we were going to get through. The second time round, it got voted up, and uh, we basically agreed to a 10% pay cut. Oh, shit. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. My dad was against the pay cuts, and he would have voted no, but Mum said that he decided to vote yes because he wanted me to have a future. And because I had the understanding of why it had to happen, uh, I supported the pay cut. There was 400 management that also went in and gave, you know, a pay reduction. There was contractors, suppliers. So everyone contributed. So the cost-saving initiatives, you know, was put into an information memorandum that was sent out globally to over 70 prospective buyers. When RM got into trouble and uh, we saw that it was up for sale, uh, I saw that as a very exciting opportunity. So Australia has always been very puzzling for me. It's a country which is blessed with every natural resource you can think of, but yet it produces nothing. It exports all its raw materials. And nothing more uh, stark uh, as an example than steel. I would leave there for about 7.30 the latest. We looked at the buyers and culled them down ultimately to two. So on the one hand, we had the GFG group with Sanjeev Gupta as its, as its executive chairman. And on the other hand, we had a private equity POSCO consortium from South Korea. No one has ever heard of Sanjeev Gupta before this. Well, then why would we? He's a mystery man, really. Be everybody, you know, Google. Sanjeev Gupta, well, what's he done? What's he worth? How's he going to do this? And that's when I sort of read up on Sanjeev and, you know, I found out he was a pretty amazing guy and he had a real vision for, for steel making. Welcome everybody to Liberty Steel Newport. It's a proud day for us today as we start production. Please let me show you around. The name Sanjeev Gupta was most prominently associated with the intervention in Newport in the steel plant there, which, like Wayala, was on its knees. Along came this extraordinary entrepreneur who told them there is a future in the Welsh steel industry. There was not a single meeting I wouldn't walk into. People would look at me say, asking me, literally, are you crazy? Why would you buy a steel industry in Britain? That was like, you know, completely, it was regarded to be completely nuts. He hasn't made any of us redundant, and throughout the country, wherever he's bought anything, nobody's been made redundant. On Sunday. Okay. But he invested. What has happened there is an unalloyed success. Is that entirely due to the vision of one man? Well, um, in this case, I, I think you've got to say, to a large extent, it is.
I must also pay a particular tribute to Sanjeev Gupta. Sanjeev is doing so much to apply real imagination, innovative thinking, and sustainable rejuvenation to our nation's heavy industries. Sanjeev, in many ways, is a, a fantastic um, story for journalists. He, he's got a great backstory. He's developed a business in a very short space of time, um, buying fantastic assets in the UK, certainly very big assets and totemic assets. I was born in Punjab in the northwest part of India. It's a business family for generations. So when I was growing up, steel and bicycles were so the two businesses the family was in mainly. Then when I was in, I think, the sort of end of ninth grade, I moved um, to the UK. I'm just starting university. I decided then to form my own company. Uh, that's when I formed uh, Liberty. And actually, it came to a point where I registered all my telephones, uh, fax machines, Celex machines at the university address. And then uh, the university found out. I didn't know that you're not supposed to run a business out of there. So I got deemed, as they say, which is like sort of when you're called in, you know, when you're being naughty. I had to go and get an apartment nearby, and it just grew and grew and grew from there. We have about $3 billion uh, net assets, 30-odd countries where we have uh, operations. So there was a bit of excitement about Sanjeev bidding for our steelworks. My personal feeling was I was hoping that it was going to be him, just given his track record. The clincher was when I went to Wyala. What I didn't know was that this hidden gem was sitting there. Everything was there. It has amazing infrastructure. The port which has been built, the airport, the town, the housing, everything has been built to be a much bigger uh, steel plant. And yet, it was a complete failure. It was basically, it was supposed to be shut. Nobody was talking about how do we make this work, can it work? It was a foregone conclusion they can't work. You bring the seal down, so you've got to create the seal. Then you create the vacuum. He asked if he could meet up with some union organisers, and uh, I was uh, lucky enough to be one of the guys that was there for that meeting. Natasha uh, just started with the company, and her father is also working here. Okay. I was particularly moved by the fact that the workers had uh, taken a pay cut, yeah, voluntarily. It was an amazing sacrifice and showed the desire of this community and these, these people that they weren't going to let this go. That's not right, it is, isn't it? Right, you can almost hit the building. Yeah. And that gave me a lot of confidence that if I bought this business, I would have a great force behind me to turn around. While as Steelworks officially has a new owner, British billionaire Sanjeev Gupta is promising more than a billion dollars of investment in the business. You could almost hear the great sigh of relief going through while I'm, someone's bought the place. You know? it, it's not going to close. It's, it's actually got a future. I was ecstatic. <laughs> It was so exciting. It was a weight off my shoulders. For the first 100 days, as you may be aware, I have taken the help myself, so I will be CEO of this business for those 100 days. It was a landmark day for Wyala, and I came out and marched on the streets as a sign of saying thank you. You know, it was probably one of the most satisfying days in my working career. There was Mr Gupta in the middle of it, with his whole family, the wife and the kids. We thought maybe we should rename the town Guptaville, because he's, he's saved the steelworks. He's saved all the jobs in Wyler. They saw death very close, right? They came very, very close to extinction. This is the spirit, the spirit of Wyler, which allowed uh, this town and these steelworks to survive the dark days. I was definitely being adopted by Wyler. There's no question about that. When I bought that business, the town adopted me. Uh, it became my town. Coming close. Sanjeev Gupta he keeps getting described as the saviour of Wyala, saviour of our city. But you know, it actually is an apt description to give to him. I don't like or want titles like uh, saviour and so on. They saved themselves because they wouldn't have been there. If they hadn't been their persistence and their unwillingness to give up, they probably would have shut. They knew, and they know today, by going through that process, they actually saved the steelworks and the iron ore mines and probably Wyala in the process. If there are other towns that are in a similar situation as we were, then I think it's definitely something they have to think about. One, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Sanjeev, 
He saw the enormity of the task he had ahead of him here in Australia. So he moved his family to Australia and is running his global operations from here. And, uh, you know, it's pretty unique in a global entrepreneur. This is my home in Sydney. Yesterday we completed our first anniversary in Australia. So today we're celebrating that with all our staff and uh, all the children, actually. No, 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 both legs together, like Oh, it was a huge, huge surprise to learn that we're moving to Sydney. We went out on a four-week holiday and he said, I don't think we should go back. And I said, yeah, are you crazy? How the hell do you expect me to, you know, move a whole family? The business which we bought is spread across the whole country, all of Australia. And Sydney, of course, is the head office. And me traveling around the country to all the locations, but mainly, of course, focused on Wyla. It is, for me, my spiritual home and uh, the spiritual home of steel in Australia. We have multiple plans in Wyla. We will go from 1 million tons to 2 million tons in terms of steel production. But it won't just be about adding capacity, it's also about upgrading the plant, making much more, much higher value added steel. Good to see Vice Red, man. It's always a happy day when we got yeah, Vice Red. <laughs> the part two is then to launch a new steel plant, you know, a world scale steel plant, maybe a 10 million ton steel plant. And it would be the first major investment Australia has seen for decades in industry. It's a huge, huge legacy, and it would put Australia on the map in terms of steel. One, two, three, go! The British billionaire who stepped in to save the Wyala Steelworks has announced a $1 billion cash splash on renewable energy projects in the local region. One of the missing things is energy. Energy is expensive. We need to fix that. We are fixing that. Some 800,000 solar panels will be installed across 1,100 hectares. He wants to take us to the next generation of steel making using renewable energy uh, to power his steel plants. And that's essentially solar, wind and hydro. So together, that gives us the ability to offer dispatchable base load power at prices cheaper than other forms of power. That is our strong conviction. Hey! Do you want one corner or two corners? I want two. There's definitely plenty of cynics still through the town. And even myself, there's this little voice in the back of my head saying, but what if it's all just talk, you know? What if it's all just a uh, pipe dream and tomorrow, you know, there's all of a sudden no funding and then we're in the same turmoil again? We we'll ship these slabs to the UK? Yep. Well, everything Mr Gupta does involves some inherent risk. I don't think it's really possible with a private company to know everything about the internal financial arrangements. When you bought the business in uh, September, that's uh, when the uh, portrait went up. <laughs> if there is a serious downturn in global trade, I think all bets would be off for Mr Gupta, but then all bets are off for all of us. I have not been able to reconcile how he can make all this work. Um, he is stepping into the shoes of really big established players. They have tried and tried and tried again and still haven't been able to make it work. I question why somebody else without that pedigree, without that history, can make a success of it. My feelings about the future of Whale have definitely changed. I am excited for the future. I can't wait to see what Sanjeev's got on the, the plan next. There's definitely an expectation that Sanjeev is going to contribute to the community. Whoa. This is the Wyla Dirt Circuit Car Club and we love coming here because it's such a good family atmosphere. My partner Dylan is one of the drivers. A lot of the guys from the Steelworks are a part of the Dirt Circuit Club. Um, just this morning, two of the guys that were here had actually just finished night shift. I always joke that I've got two little steel makers <laughs> and that one day they'll probably work at the steelworks too. You see Daddy over there, look. There's been a lot of damage done, obviously, and a lot of people left town, a lot of businesses closed. Everybody knows that it's, it's not going to be an overnight change, but it's certainly a, a lot better feeling. Wyala has been given a second chance. You know, it needs to make the most of that second chance to continue as a vibrant community.
and they can't rest on their laurels and just go, I'm glad that's behind us because the challenge is still ahead of them. Nice to meet you, mate. I was really excited to meet Sanjeev and, like, given the opportunity, I was so nervous. Sanjeev, can I please get a photo because you're my hero and I want to put it on my Facebook and everybody will jealous. <laughs> I'm sure we will have success. We have success already. We're already making money in our plants. There are great promises ahead. Now, how much of that promise can we actually actualize? That is an unknown. And I mean, there, there will be enough opportunities in the world. Yeah, maybe they'll go into fabrication, yeah. into something else, into the world. When things are going well, for me, it just eggs me on to the next one. Enjoyment for me is finding the next thing to do and the next challenge and the next progress to make. So what I'm trying to say is that I will never stop in Wyala. I will move on in the sense that I will leave Australia, I will move on to another country. First of September next year is when I will leave. That's the target. But our business will continue and it will continue to grow from strength to strength. So Wyala will continue to grow in its own way forever.